It was 50 years ago, April 1944, that Arthur Miller's first play, The Man Who Had All the Luck, opened on Broadway. And then it closed four days later. In the half-century since, though, he has become one of the great names in American theater history, writing over 20 enduring plays, including The Crucible, The Price, An Incident of Vichy, and at least one American classic, Death of a Salesman. Arthur Miller's work was once called Passion in Search of a Context. Now he comes to us with a new drama, Broken Glass, starring Amy Irvin, Ron Rifkin, and David Dukes, that puts some of his greatest passions in context, and I'm pleased to have him here. Welcome. Thank Fifty you. years. Fifty years of writing plays. You didn't repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, are you getting better? I don't know that you get better. I hope I don't get worse. Uh, but it's the same problem from the beginning to the end. Which is? Form. To give your feelings dramatic form, I guess. And uh, that never changes. Not only for me, but anybody else. Um, this one, I want to put that in the context of what you just said. This obviously deals with Jewish identity. It deals with a sense of the context of, uh, of people, personal, political. Uh, was this something that's been swirling around in your own Jewishness and you were looking for context, looking for time to express it? The truth is that it all comes out of an image. The image of a woman whom I knew 50 years ago or more uh, struck uh, with a paralysis that nobody could understand. A vital, vibrant, terrific young woman in her, I would say, late 30s. And uh, that has been with me for a half century more. Did you know her well? Sure. And uh, suddenly it popped up uh, two years ago again, uh, out of where I don't know. Would you remember the moment? Uh, no. I just uh, was there suddenly. It seemed to be there forever. And I began developing it. Uh, what could have happened? How did it happen? Let me understand this. So, I mean, 50 years ago, you knew a woman. The, the, your character's a little bit older than that, right? Yeah. Okay. So, you, you, you thought about this woman. Now, was this a member of your family? No. Okay. No. You thought about it, but somebody you knew. Yeah. And you were always sort of curious about why she developed this psychosomatic paralysis. Right. Right? And then it sort of pops up, and you think about it. You find yourself thinking about it. You then what? You then said, I want to write about this? There is a play here, or what? Well, you try a few uh, beginning scenes to see if there's anything there that you can handle. It's a bit like if you've got a big pot of, uh, of uh, some plastic substance, like a sculpture. Yeah. And uh, he play, starts yeah. to fool with this and see what comes out of it. And one thing leads to another. And one form leads to another form. Mm. But you didn't begin with the notion, aha, uh -huh, I found a way to explore something that's been with me for a long time. Well, that's implicit in the, okay. in the thing. Yeah. I, I, uh, I didn't know that it would develop into anything. Mm. Let's talk about what the play is and then talk about you and, and, and where the two come together, obviously. Um, she, tell me what it's about in your judgment. Basically, the play is about two people who are both fleeing from their identity and trying to go toward it at the same time. She has this, been, go ahead. In this case, they're Jews, but it's as obvious, I think, it's anybody's identity. Mm -hmm. uh, and what's happened, it happens at a specific time in history, which is 1938, the latter part of November, uh, when there's an explosion of violence in Europe against Jews, which was unbelievable at the time. Uh, we thought, everybody thought that Europe was too civilized for that kind of thing. So that this shock has raised the question for her, who am I? What connection have I got with all that? And uh, meantime, she has a very strained relation with her husband because he's running away from his identity. He's fleeing from it, uh, from the Jewish identity, which is understandable at the time because there was an enormous amount of anti-Semitism in this country at that time. 1938. In 38, it was dreadful. 
It was so strong that I think it's one of the biggest reasons why Roosevelt turned away the Jews who wanted to come get out of Nazi Germany. And were able to get out of Nazi Germany and arrived here and, and were turned, turned back. back yeah. Yeah, there was just a, a documentary on public television about yes. this, very controversial, and Arthur Schlesinger and others right. stepped forward to say, wait a minute, may, may be fair to Roosevelt. What he yeah, did, but did I not think know. that... But you're talking uh, about the atmosphere. The atmosphere was... was clearly anti-Semitism was, was rampant. dense. Yeah, Father... And uh, so this raises, in that form, how she is to relate to a man who is fleeing from himself. And incidentally, fleeing from himself as a husband and a lover. Mm. So... Uh, it's all intertwined in one image, the political and the social and the personal and the sexual, uh, which is why it started to fascinate me. And were you also sort of driven forward by the fact that we are now seeing in a post-Cold War world the rise in, what, for the lack of a better word, tribalism and the well, breakdown this, of even nationalism? Exactly. I think that this struggle that he's going through, and she is, is probably uh, reproduced in many different places in the world. And vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Bosnia Herzegovina, vis-a-vis -vis Serb as against Croat. Mm -hmm. I mean, vis -vis I wouldn't have believed Republics. 30 years ago that we would devolve into this kind of tribalism again. I don't think many people ever believed it. Why anyway. did we? I think because the, probably the, the great imperialisms which kept order in the world, such as it was, with all the repression, collapsed. There's no British dominion anymore, there's no French, there's no German, and the American type is simply a commercial kind of, uh, of uh, imperialism, if you want to call it that. There is no, the Roman army has gone back to Rome, and these local uh, antagonisms which were repressed. There, there are no them. longer restraining forces at work. There's none. There's no longer. Well, in, in Eastern Europe, you had the Soviet Union. Right. You know, and, uh, and the Tito. Big, the big fellows left. So all these little uh, demagogues in various parts of the world see an opportunity, which indeed it is, mm -hmm. to arouse people. Uh, mm -hmm. But, but the interesting thing about it is all those things, all that divides them now was there. It was just, un it was just it's under control and repressed. It's always been there. If you there. ever spent any time in Yugoslavia before this happened, yeah. you could smell it. But Tito and the Communist Party wanted to exercise their own power, and they couldn't do that if these local chieftains and local sects yeah. were, to, were allowed to be right. And how do you make this link between the personal and the political? Well, that's what I love to do. <laughs> that's why <laughs> I asked I, the question. I think uh, we are fish in the water, but the water is also in the fish. Yeah. We're swimming through social and economic and political problems and, and life, but we don't only swim through it, that's swimming through us. So I can't conceive of erecting a character without asking uh, certain questions about him that are political and social questions. Mm -hmm. And uh, our, uh, my, my theater is filled with this question, and I think it's one of the reasons why it's comprehensible elsewhere. Because they're I, I, all... Obs wait, wait, it's comprehensible elsewhere, meaning that it's comprehensible in, in Europe? Europe. Yeah. How do you explain the fact that, that you are more, not honored, but things that haven't done well in America have done well in Europe. It may be that uh, our theater is basically an entertainment theater. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. It's becoming film and television. And if you look yeah. at the subjects yeah. that our theater yeah. has dealt with. In commercials. And look at the subjects that the movies have dealt with. Yeah. And television. There's no comparison as to their, their seriousness. Our theater is rarely involved with uh, anymore. It used to be the opposite. The, the, the uh, movies were the trivial art yeah. and the theater was heavy with significance. It rarely happens anymore. And why is that though? I think the audience has, has narrowed. The price of the ticket is very high. So you're speaking only to a certain economic level people. Yeah. Uh, you've got to spend $50 for a ticket, you've got to want to laugh. Yeah. 
You, and you want to go away happy, and you want to want to go away happy, you want to go away tapping yeah. your feet. Well, speaking of that, this is for you, or, or generally, in terms of the theater, a, a less than a two-hour production. Right. That's, it's an hour and 40 minutes. Yeah, why do you do that? I mean, is that all you had to say, or you were thinking... I was trying to... You know, the Greek drama is about that long. Yeah. And that's my ideal, anyway. It's, uh... Why make it longer if you can make it in that time? Yeah. Why do you... I, I, this is, sounds silly to say this to you. I mean, but why do you keep at it when you know that there may be less of an appetite for it? You know, I mean, is, is it simply this is what I do? It's what I. It's the same reason that a dog barks. <laughs> so <laughs> the reason a dog barks is the reason Arthur writes plays. Yeah, it's, uh, so it's, it's a reaction to sound, to light, to uh, to life. And as long as I'm alive, I'll be doing that. How do you do it? You do it early in the morning, obviously. I work uh, from about 8 o'clock to noon, yeah. if I'm lucky. If I'm not lucky, I can't work that long. 8 o'clock till noon. Yeah. Four hours? It's a long time. No, it's not. It's a short time. Well, if you're making it up, it's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> it's different. Uh, <laughs> It's different dealing with I'm what just, people I'm have just told you. Second gear on four. <laughs> what, go ahead. Yeah, no. <laughs> no, it's 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 what? Yeah, to to keep at work it was a long time. At four Is hours. it agony to sit there and have to put words in a character's mouth? It's a pleasurable agony. Yeah, but it's painful because I mean because well, it, sure, it doesn't come easy. So you got to without I mean, the pain, there's no there's no uh, truth in it. I mean, one is always resisting the truth. Our audiences do, and the artist does mm -hmm. first of all. You, let me just, uh, death of a salesman. Even then, they said, they, whoever they are, said, it will not play oh, absolutely. in Europe. And it even played in China. Well, they thought it was the uh, most American type right. problem and that uh, the Europeans would never understand it. Of course, uh, it's not at all an American problem. It's, as time went on, in fact, I just directed it in Sweden a year ago or so, and uh, the Swedes said, uh, you know, we played it here when you came out in 1950. And uh, it, it, was, it was a great success there then, but we felt it was basically an American problem. He said, she said, yeah. this woman said to me, now it's our problem. Now it's our problem. That is the alienation of the person right, and, right. and the, uh, that terrible dichotomy between uh, what the man thinks he is and what he really is in the commercial world. And, and how do you come to grips with the value of a life? Right. And the Chinese, you know? except the Chinese did something which always made me laugh when I saw it. The CBS did a program about the opening of the play in China. Yeah. And they interviewed a couple of people coming out of the theater who could speak English. And one of them was a young guy and the, the interviewer said, uh, Bill Moyers, in fact, was the interviewer, and he said, uh, well, what did you think of this play? And the young guy said, oh, it's wonderful. He said, see, that Willie Loman, he's right. <laughs> he says, that son of his, Biff, he says, he's got it all wrong. <laughs> he says, everybody wants to be number one man. Now, of course, you were talking to somebody who'd come out of a quarter of a century of communist uh, indoctrination and suppression of his ambitions. Yeah. And here, the Mao Zedong had just died, and the thing was opening up. Yeah. And he wanted to be Willie. He didn't want to be Biff. Yeah, he wanted to. So that made me very happy, though, to think that there was enough truth in there to go around. Yeah. Are you still, and this may be naive, but are you, you still are finding out things about yourself? Oh, yeah. Because of, because of the kinds of issues you grapple with. I mean, you're looking inside of yourself for some understanding. Well, broken glass. Some is, under yeah, well, I'm getting to that. Dealing with that. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, because you said you unearthed things that I was not expecting about yourself. Right. Like what? Well, in the case of this play, I guess uh, the uh, the power of the need to uh, identify with uh, my own Jewishness, which I'd frankly uh, was a dead issue for a long, long time. I never felt uh, particularly needful of that. It may be growing old and uh, having a glimpse of Father Abraham up there now, but uh, whatever it is, uh, I, uh, I take pleasure in, uh, in, uh, in that identification, although I'm 
terribly opposed to uh, uh, that kind of nationalism. Which, which you're reflecting about in terms of how you see the political world. Yeah, right. like the Israeli nationalism sometimes goes crazy. Well, like when? Well, well, like you're not, you're not talking about the Hebron incident. Uh, well, okay, uh, well clear that, that is. simply was the climax of a yeah, lot of Zionism ideology. is not crazy. Or there are crazy Zionists and there are intelligent Zionists. Okay, I mean the idea, not, not the Well, conception not the of a homeland is fine. It's a, it's a great thing. But uh, when you are absolutely right and everybody's absolutely wrong, yeah. I have to get off the train. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> You've reached my stop. I'll be seeing you here. <laughs> but how did, did you go through, you, Arthur Miller, uh, go through a period in which you... you what are you saying about under, coming to tips with your own, coming to terms with your own Jewishness? I hear you saying I wanted to emphasize it and take pride in it in my 78th year, well, however old you are. Uh, but did you earlier not feel a pride in it, not feel a sense of what? Uh, I felt that uh, I, sp I had a lot of feelings, different feelings. Sometimes I would feel that uh, I was being grabbed at by uh, the nationalist idea, the yeah. people. By, who are always trying to make me march with the, yeah. with the rest of the troops. And you and rebelled I, at that? Why? Well, I just, I can't differentiate Jews from anybody else in the basics of human character. That's what's life. in this play. Yes. And I We're think... We're all uh, part of humanity. That's the idea. Right. And I cannot... Uh, I knew a Catholic woman in Ohio way back, and uh, very well. She was then my mother-in-law, and it happened that was, there was a robbery of a bank, and uh, I saw it in the paper, and she read it in the paper, and she said, "Oh, I hope he's not a Catholic." The the thief, the robber, because he hit somebody over the head, and I thought, "Well, there's my mother. You see, she would say, oh, I hope he's not Jewish.'" This is going on all the time, but we prefer, or a lot of us do, to say this is purely a Jewish or a Catholic or a Protestant or whatever characteristic, and it's nonsense. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling because I know I hear you. On the one hand, you're saying, look, you know, it, it's a little bit, we ought to be proud of our ethnic origins. On the other hand, we're all really, in the end, the same. I think so. Is that what you're saying? I'm, well... Put it this way. Then why emphasize it? I, I, uh, because it the etiquette of peoples differs greatly. In other words, the way a son addresses his parents is different in China than it is here. How is it different? Well, in Death of a Salesman, there's a line where the son says to the father, to the mother, he, would, he calls her pal. Yeah. And when the actress, when it was translated for him, and he, he thought this was outlandish. He could never call his any his parent. Pal. It's but he couldn't call an older person pal. Now that's etiquette. Once it was explained to him what the emotional content of that was, he could do it perfectly well. Uh, when the, the actor was asked, uh, "What would you say when you wanted to pick up a girl in a restaurant?" Uh, how would you uh, build up your uh, your persona? Because uh, the two sons come into this restaurant and they're trying to pick up this girl and Happy says of his brother Biff, uh, he's a quarterback with the New York Giants, which of course is a complete lie. And uh, they don't have football, so we had to supplant that with some memory that this actor would conceivably have. So I said, well, what would you say in that situation, you see? Well, I would say that I have a uh, brother in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> the idea was completely the same. It's the same idea. It's just that the this, this social circumstance... I have a brother is, who's in Hong Kong. The, that means that that brother... Had done something. Had done something. And he was probably loaded. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> Do you think about death? No more than once or twice a day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so what do you think about when you think about death? I try not to meet it too soon. Okay, well, I mean, no, you'd like to use it. It's something I'd like to delay as long as possible. Yeah. I, uh, I think it gives uh, our lives significance. Imagine if you didn't die. 
what a horror that would be. Uh, there would be no, uh, nothing to measure your life against. Uh, when you die, you want to, uh, you're adding things up. And uh, it's inconceivable. So I, I do think about it. I have always thought about it. Would I, and so when you take a when you take a measure of your life, does it make you feel content, satisfied? Uh, I mean, can you look up and say, "Well, I be have a parents terrific, and say, Arthur did all right." I have terrific children, as it yeah. happens. Uh, that makes me uh, feel content. The children. Uh, the, ch the children, yeah. yeah. That's the and most important legacy you have. Not the death of a salesman, you. not well, uh, let me tell you about a Pulitzer Prize. The, the Pulitzer Prizes and death of a salesman. Uh, I'm applauding you. I'm not disagreeing with no, you. No, I, say, I say that if I asked you to give me the names of... Uh, four or five of the most significant and famous playwrights of 1920 to 1940, you'd be hard put. And yet at the time when they were going, every literate person knew their names. So uh, when people speak of the longevity of their, of their names and lifetimes, whether they be playwrights, artists, uh, novelists, poets, whatever, actors, you have to grin slightly because it can all blow away as the time goes by. Now, who is to know what lasts or doesn't last? All you can do is your best at any one, at any one moment. You were 78. Do you, are, you, are there themes like this that you very much want to express? I mean, you've touched on... I have you, another work that I want to do quickly, yes. Which, Quickly, meaning I want to get, make sure I get it while I'm operating on all cylinders. Yeah, right. Uh, I, I don't worry about that much. I'm probably more alert now than I was uh, 15 years ago for some reason. You don't know why? I have no idea. I mean, it's no... I, uh, I really don't know, but I, I feel more with it than... It may be the times now. I think there's a curious contradiction going on now. The uh, there are terrible, terrible times, but people are more open. There's a more open search for answers than they used to be. They're not as contented with what they think they are. What did you think about the death of Richard Nixon and, and what some of the people, a lot of people were saying about him? A couple of things. One, taking note of, of the campaigns in California, taking note of, I mean, you really were on the opposite sides with him, and especially back, I mean, yeah. during the communist scare, uh, which ended in uh, the run for the president in 1960. Then in 68, he comes back. Then in 74, he leaves, so 72, and disgraced constitutional issues. Now, after another 20 years, there was a sense of a different kind of respect for him. Could you share in that, or did it offend you? Or I can't respect him because, uh, quite frankly, because he, he really betrayed that office. The President of the United States takes an oath that he will take care that the laws are obeyed. That's in the oath of office. And uh, he didn't do that. He uh, took care that the law be transgressed. So that's a serious breach, in my opinion. However, objectively, I cannot deny that his break is uh, is opening to China, for example. Mm -hmm. oh, he, he was probably the only one who could have done it, and maybe he had to do it. Uh, well, the reason he could he was the only one who could have done it was that he was so right wing that the right would accept. Sure, his credentials were intact. Uh, a liberal wouldn't dare do this, and it was a great service to humanity that this breach be healed. Uh, also to the Russians. Detente and building on a new strategy. Yeah. And uh, it may have been purely strategic. Well, can sure you, can you, President Kennedy said, at, I mean, President Clinton said at the, in his eulogy, we, it's time that now we view Richard Nixon in the totality of his life. 
That doesn't mean, however, that one makes nothing of Watergate. No, it doesn't. And but it means that, also you make something saying. of the other thing. No, I yeah. think it, it says that don't, you don't just well, look at okay. Watergate. That's you know, fine. And you don't just look at, right. at, at witch hunting and communist times and all that. Yes, I wouldn't, uh, f I wouldn't uh, the, I mean, ever that the allow, atmosphere. if I were leading the thought of the country, uh, I wouldn't want people to forget that this happened because the next president who was tempted to break into uh, political headquarters with his uh, underlings is liable to do it, thinking, well, it's not a very serious breach that the president supervised a burglary. Yeah, well, the, most people believe he covered it up rather than he supervised it. Well, I... Uh, Either way, it uh, was, the cover-up was a violation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. When you look at... Uh, who do you admire today in terms of what they're writing? Who writing? You, yeah. Who do you read and say, I can't put this down? Or when did you last go to the theater and have an experience like a lot of people have when they first see Death of a Salesman? I haven't seen anything in the theater that has moved me like that. You know, yeah, not like that, Death of a Salesman, level. but uh, I've seen uh, some good movies. Like, 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 like Schindler's List or... Chandler's List is a good movie. Yeah, that, that touched me. Uh, Three Weddings and a Funeral was terrific. Yeah, I want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I can't think of head of all the others I've seen, yeah. but I've seen some good things. You the Piano were, was, a, was an interesting movie. Yeah. You only wrote one screenplay, as I remember. I mean, was Misfits were the only screenplay you wrote? Uh, I wrote another one, which was a, uh, put on, uh, done a couple of years ago, called uh, Everybody Wins with Deborah Winger. It went bad. I didn't see that. It went by very quickly. <laughs> uh, Carol Rice directed it. Yeah. And I have just uh, written a screenplay of The Crucible, which... Uh, oh, that's right. It's, and, and Kenneth Branagh is going to do it, right? Kenneth Branagh is going to do it yeah. uh, with Emma Thompson. Is Thompson. Right. Yeah, I mean, that's good for you. I mean, it, 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 but is, oh, I hope... Is, is, didn't I read that something else may be brought to the screen other than The Crucible? Is there some talk about... Not that yeah. I know. Well, you would know. Not necessarily. Don't they have Sometimes to come to you? <laughs> to be told. Yeah. Would you do anything different? I mean, would you, when you look back at the evolution in your own life? I wish I had written more plays, but I don't know how you do that. I don't know how I could have been uh, more pro prolific. Yeah, uh, there was. I have the feeling. I used to have it anyway. Maybe I'm wrong. That it, had there been a going uh, non-commercial theater here on a high level, as like it is, is in London. Well, as in London, I think I may have written more. Yeah. It's very tough here. Yeah, but here's my question. <laughs> Are you ready? Uh, do you think uh, that the greatness that people saw in Death of a Salesman has been repeated? You, Arthur Miller. It depends which production you're talking about. I've seen productions of A View from the Bridge, a production of View from the Bridge in London, which was unbelievable uh, in the National Theatre. There was a production of, uh, that Olivier did of uh, The Crucible, which made me feel that may have been the best thing I've ever done. Olivier's production of The Crucible? 67, I think it was, 68. Yes, it was a towering What did he work. do? Well, first of all, he directed it. Yeah, no, and, I, know uh, I know that. But what was it that he made it, it simply, so? Uh, what can a director do to a work that takes it somewhere that even the playwright didn't he see? He can infuse the spirit, his own spirit. He, so it's a it's a merger of your words and your your passion in context yeah. with his own. And the, they they spoke that language in a way that I'd never heard of. Yeah. You have said also about theater today that it's hard to, or you believe this, I think, that it's hard to find actors who can play the kinds of roles that you're writing. In our theater because today... Because it's not the training. Well, in our theater today, it's, t it's tough or impossible to be a theater actor. Yeah. Because you can't no, make a living. There's no long career. You cannot ex expect a person to come out of television where he's talking the way I'm talking to you now and project himself to 850 or 1,000 people. Uh, it's not possible. Go to see uh, uh, Medea. Yeah. I doubt that we were able to do Medea on that level. There are probably some older actors who are still around that might be able to swing it, but 
not the younger people, because they are, they're, the instrument has been used mm -hmm. in that way. We've got to constrict it. If you don't use it, you lose it. And you lose it. It's simply a muscle that doesn't get developed. In this kind of theater we've got, we've got an entertainment commercial theater, which has its built-in limitations, and that's one of them. You cannot develop actors on that scale. And yet we have some of the most talented people in the world when it comes to realistic, dead-on uh, naturalism, put it that way. Nobody does it better than we do. We are the envy of the English when it comes to talking with each other like people do. Like this? Like this. Nobody does it better. But as soon as some expressiveness beyond the to naturalistic... Reach the, to reach someone in the back rafters. Something beyond the naturalistic yeah. uh, mode, we begin to get in trouble. Those muscles haven't been trained. Because we haven't been doing that kind of work. It's all, it's all yeah. that's involved. Have you ever thought about why didn't I... I mean, I ask about regrets, and you know, you've talked about thinking about death twice a day at least. Uh, did you ever patent the notion maybe I ought to go to London and write there? Or, or would that have been Look, my roots alien are, to you because your roots I, are here I in your experience? I couldn't live anywhere else, really, uh, not happily. I, uh, I belong here with all its uh, problems. It's, uh, it's where I, uh, my roots are, uh, and I'm uh, miserable half the time, but... Uh, that's Why are you it. miserable? Well, you get impatient with the way fake politicians keep creating uh, followings, and I'm also uh, sometimes the culture gets me down. Uh, like when I try to cast a play here, and we spend a year finding five people. Well, then you find them and you fire one of them, or one of them leaves. Yeah, right. Soon as, uh, as soon as you start, it's it? too difficult. Yeah, well, did you have something to do with? Silver leaving and, and I think we all and, agreed and that he wasn't the, right for that yeah. part. That's all. It was a wrong emotional color. He, he understood that as well. He did. As we, oh, I think so. And can you sit down with an actor and talk about that? Why not? Sure. Yeah. But back to my question though, about greatness and brilliance and 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 uh, are you are you essentially? I mean, you've been a man with a message, a lot of messages, mainly about human relationships and about coming to grips with. Uh, of the human experience and the larger world, the context, right? I mean, that's a fair summary of what mm -hmm. you're about in a simplistic way. You are essentially, uh, can you say I've done the best I could? Yeah, I guess, look, I'm a fatalist. I think that uh, your fate is your character. And if I wasted a lot of time, which I think I have. Wasted? Yeah, I could have uh, probably uh, forgotten about the conditions of theater and not allowed myself to get discouraged with them. Yeah. You, you, you wish you had done that? I wish I hadn't. Oh, that's uh, what I thought. Yeah. Now, here's why I'm asking this question. Because so many times you hear people who are dying on the deathbed say, yeah. you know, if I have one word to say to you, think about this day and then figure out where you are now and what are you going to do in between. I mean, is that... I don't think about that day. I've had that feeling all my life, though. You, I'd better think about... Where am I going? Yeah, <laughs> and how I travel. Right, yeah. how I get there. You, could, you, you, the, the drought for you was for about seven years where you didn't write hardly anything, wasn't it? Yeah, I think that's not uncommon, however. Uh, people go through that uh, kind of a spell. Uh, I wouldn't say I didn't write anything, well, but, but uh, I didn't write anything for this theater. The theater is... That's because your passion was elsewhere? Not really. You get the feeling that you're dealing... You have to close your eyes to it because it's there and what the hell are you going to do about it? But the, our theater is so commercialized. The theater that I was born into. Yeah. Uh, that uh, you feel, well, I'm... Uh, I'm a, a commodity, and that's a discouraging thing. See, I'm, uh, I'm only carrying on this bewailing uh, cry out of uh, Odette's and O'Neill, who were... O'Neill couldn't write a letter without uh, referring to the show shop, as he called it, which he hated with a passion, 
because, I mean, after all, he went to Sweden to open two or three plays until the end of his life because he didn't think there was either the actor here or the audience to take him as seriously as he felt he needed to be taken. And uh, it may be that uh, we're being unfair to that audience. I sometimes think we are, that it's, it's not their fault, but it's a, it is a problem. It's a real one. Look, uh, the, the number of, we've got 12 million people in this city, I guess, and uh, 250 million in the country, and Broken Glass is, I think, the only serious play on the street along with... Uh, on Broadway. On Broadway. Yeah, along with what? Uh, Perestroika. Perestroika, yeah. yeah. I mean, that isn't a great deal. Well, and Devere Smith would you would you would call Twilight, but it's not well, it's, it's not a fiction. It's, it's not created not, out of it's a, not quite it's, a it's, place. it's different. It's yeah. wonderful theater. Yeah, it's wonderful theater. It's wonderful theater. But it's serious and has a message. But uh, and what is and that simply is it, it's more than economics. It seems to me in part it may it, be a cultural yeah, thing. Yeah, it's a cultural thing. Yes. I think. It I'm not seemed, sure, but it seems to me that perhaps it is. I mean, I don't know who you blame, and whether people who would be doing what you're doing in addition to you are going to other medium a or other media. But B, the notion that, that there is today the theater as a place where we have great debates and, and go for an understanding of who we are. You see, it still exists, but on a narrower level than one would like in, in the British National Theater. Does it really? What, so what are they putting on there now? Well, at the moment, it's probably dry, Yeah, I, I will admit. But I've seen some stuff that would never be produced here and hasn't been produced here. Because it couldn't and bring nor would it nor was it produced on the British West End, mm -hmm. the Broadway. Right, right, right. A, it may cost too much. Uh, well, they're doing uh, the broken glass there. It'll be yeah. on in August. See, I, I called Different cast there, British cast. A British cast. Well, right. I called for a, a uh, cellist. Who starts the play? You see yeah. a cellist right. sitting there right. playing the cello. Well, we can't have a cellist here. We have a tape. Now, now that's why is that? Because it costs too much to have a cellist. Yeah. <laughs> what does it cost to get a cellist? For goodness' sake. Well, then so you got to have backup. You got to right. have all kinds of right. other costs involved. So you put it on a tape. Well, they're going to have a cellist. I mean, it's 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 absurd. It's crazy. And, and how much better will it make it? I don't know. I haven't ever seen it with a cellist. This is a brand new play. Maybe I'll regret it. Yeah. But I'll have a chance to look at it. You know what's it. interesting about plays, and I, I, this just shows you how naive I am, uh, is I think of plays as primarily the gift of the playwright. It's a lot of other stuff there. But not a, and the playwright and the actors, but the director and the staging and the production. I mean, all of those kinds of things. Because you mentioned The Crucible with Olivier. It was the staging of it. It was a lot of other things well, that infused uh, it to make it, to helpless. lift it to another zone. That the playwright is, it's a bit like uh, music. If you write a symphony and you have uh, medium fiddlers, it's not going to sound like it will when you have the, uh, the Philharmonic playing that same piece ah, of music. But can the Philharmonic <laughs> take a bad piece of music and make it sound good? It'll make it sound better. But it won't make it sound good, no. But it'll sound better. Yeah. But if you are demanding things of an orchestra or of actors, which is uh, which are difficult things to do, then uh, you and they are not easy with this kind of problem. You're going to have to cut down your demands. I'm asking this off the top of my head kind of thing. But I mean, do you look around and see anything that really turns you on, that excites you? I mean, I mean, what's good about America today? What do you like about... The constant evolution of this country is fascinating. See, we don't... One of the costs of our lives is that we have no... Our roots are constantly being torn up. We regenerate ourselves all the way? But life. there is... Uh, you know, there's a payback. We are uh, constantly evolving. You go to Europe, and they love the past, but they're uncertain about the future, about how to make it. And we love the future, and we have no past. What Look, do you mean we have no past? 
people don't remember. I mean, you realize that people don't know who Nixon was? Yeah, I know. I do. I do. And I, you uh, sometimes, in, and you go out and be interviewed by college students. And, I'm and, talking and about educated people. They have no sense of, of history before the Kennedy, past is, almost before the Kennedy. The past is, uh, used to be say, the past is prologue. Right. Uh, with us, the past is boring. But I would seem that you would bemoan that. I mean, that's a that's a terrible, terrible. sense of I think it, to, you know. It makes people uneasy with themselves. Yeah. It makes it more difficult for them to find who they are. But are you saying here that in America we have what is best about us is our excitement about the future. What is worst about us is our loss of memory right. about the past. It's amnesia, incorporated. But why, what is it about the American strain of the American character that makes us we that way? We always have this, you know. Uh, de Tocqueville uh, in 1832, whatever it was, said that uh, the American is not interested in yesterday. That's a long time ago. And those were basically foreign-born people he was talking about. When you think about us as a people, Americans, uh, and you, you, tr you just mentioned you directed in Stockholm, you, direct, you, know, you were in China, you've been, you're everywhere. How do you think we stack up in terms of our values, in terms of our our discipline in terms of, of uh, our place here? I don't know of a virtue that we don't have, put it that way, that anybody a else has got. Yeah. yeah. And I got you. Nobody has some, well, you might argue that, the, that some Asian countries have more discipline than we do. Yeah, and, uh, but... But it, less originality, that they have less creativity. It's, it's less creative. See, I, I, I've always tried to... Uh, uh, back the idea here that we need a national theater, some theater which can do art. But I have to admit, you see, that with all the chaos here, we create more new stuff than those theaters do. That's the contradiction. Uh, what we need in this country is a combination of wild private enterprise, where people put money in stuff that yeah. they think is going to attract a big audience, and that conserving force, which is in a national theater. Uh, we only have the, the uh, commercial side of it, which is no longer working. It was working on two cylinders. Yeah. Could you write a good novel? I'm not sure about that. Why I, have you never wanted to find out? Well, I, I wrote one novel called Focus, I didn't written in 1944, written, incidentally, about anti-Semitism. Oh, in New thing. York, yeah, right. In '42, yeah. Uh, you, you, when did you write? You wrote it in '42. Oh, well, it was no. about anti-Semitism. No, no, no. I wrote it in '44. Excuse yeah. me. In I wrote it because that. I failed on Broadway. And you thought you failed because of I was anti-Semitism? No, 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 no. I, th I failed because. Oh, oh I, I see. I hated the theater by then because my play lasted four days. And I couldn't detect any resemblance with the script mm -hmm. with what I saw on the stage. So I decided to become a novelist. And, and what did you find out about yourself as a novelist? Well, it was a very successful novel, actually, at that time. It was probably the first American novel, I know of no other, but it may be, there may be others, yeah. about that subject. Y you believe, I mean, you want people to come to the theater to, to hear what you have to say and you want to excite them, you want them to be excited, you want to take them somewhere else, and you want them to hear your message. Yes? All right. Uh, would you have, would you make, if I had something I could say to you that would say, Arthur, I know how to change this to, to make it a commercial success. I'm not talking about broken glass, but some of the others that didn't do so well. Would you have been willing to make that compromise? I mean... Uh... I don't know what compromise you would have to make. I don't see. either, but I'm just playing with the idea. <laughs> no, the, uh, you see, I've had uh, plays which uh, initially, when they came out, got so-so reviews, maybe one or two good ones, and the rest indifferent. That happened with all my sons. The only real hot review I got happened to be on the New York Times with Brooks Atkinson, who saw to it that uh, he wrote two big pieces about the play and about me. I was unknown at the time. And by the end of that season, I won the Critics' Award with yeah. a play which the others had substantially dismissed. I can't go by 
the acceptance of anything at any one time. The Crucible didn't get any great notices, you know. I didn't know that. Uh, View from the Bridge didn't get any great notices. That's what I thought. Was somebody said it was going to be made into a movie of some kind. But yeah. Okay. But it didn't. Not good notices. There were yeah. one or two good ones. Yeah. But uh, time goes by, and they see them again. Yeah. Have you ever said to yourself, I mean, you have, you have always, almost Nixonian, been I mean, pushed forward, and you have never doubted your ability? Or did you after... I always doubt my ability, but I'm fighting to, to, describe, to define myself in the theater. It's a struggle always. Sure. It's not as though I... I'm absolutely certain of what I'm doing. I think if you're that certain, you stop doing it. Because what? It's not very original. It's not very. You're not it's discovering not very anything authentic. anymore. It's not very. Yeah. yeah. Once you get that contented, you might as well go to sleep. Yeah, but you know some people that sort of do that on the theater, don't you? I'm sure. And they, you know, yeah. make lots of money because they. It's almost like they have. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy to do. It's hard. It's harder than trying to do what I'm doing. <laughs> which is to which is what? I don't know to uh, discover new stuff all the time, discover myself anew. But if you're going to repeat yourself, it's very boring. But I think it's harder to do that. I don't know the answer to this. Have you written your memoirs? I wrote a book called Time Bends. Time Bends. Sure. Nine hundred pages. When of was that? Stuff. Three or four years ago. You said everything you had to say. Oh no! I oh, could no. do a whole book, uh, a whole other one. Are you going to do another one? I don't think so. Why not? It'll pour into other work. Really? Yeah. It was a form I'd never done before. And and what? Autobiography. Yeah. And that, I, I did it once, and I'm, that's enough. Were you pleased with it? Was it oh yeah. Was I it cathartic? It it put it this way: it put me on the record as I see the record. And uh, yeah. it goes on all over the world. It's in 18 languages, that book. And uh, I'm glad it's there. The people who were interested yeah, can refer. Yeah, you've got a certain responsibility to do it yeah. because of... Well, you, as I said earlier, everybody forgets everything. That's the law of life. I wrote a play in which uh, God appears, and he speaks uh, about the future, and they, they, uh, the devil says... Uh, uh, I've got, there's a line in which he says, uh, nobody remembers the past. It's the future they, uh, that they're remembering. You ever think of what your obituary might mean or say and what you would want it to say? What would you want it to say? Writer. Writer. Well, tell me more. That's all. That's should say it. But, but writer of what? Well, then they'd have to look up what I wrote. That'd be a hard job. That's, uh, I have no other uh, distinction that I can see. I can write plays. That's enough for me. can write plays and create characters and find a connection between the human experience and the political experience. Um, Have some insight into the dilemma that touches a common chord with all of us. Tell me how you feel, but finally, because we're we've spent an hour together about broken glass. Figure it out. Tell me about it. I mean what what it has been an hour. I know it passed fast. Uh, Broken glass. You want to, in the end, to say. I mean, you want. Uh, how do you feel about it as a work? I love it. I think it's a wonderful piece of work. You really do. I, I mean, this is something. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's a. It's basically that. It's a piece of work, for me. It's a condensation of a lot of preoccupations. Yeah, I, I just wonder whether it meant more to you, and you felt better about it because, because. You told me it reached back into an earlier time because it's. it's I because think it's thought about it's, your Jewish it's combining in one image the political, social, and psychological and sexual lives of these people, mm -hmm. and that's not easy to do.
Wait, it's at the which theater? It's at the booth. That's what I thought. Yeah. I didn't want to make a mistake. Yeah. I want to take a look at a clip here, Broken Glass with Amy Irving and David Dukes. Here it is. We've been talking about it before I leave this hour. I want you at least to have a sense of what it looks like on video. Here it is. Harriet tells me you used to take out our cousin, Rosalind Fine. It's possible. I don't remember. Well, you had so many, didn't you? When I was younger. Rosalind said you used to do acrobatics on the beach. And all the girls would stand around going crazy for you. That was a long time ago. And you'd take them under the boardwalk. Well, no one had money for anything else. Didn't you used to go to the beach? Sure, but I never did anything like that. You must have been very shy. I guess. But I had to look after my sisters, being the eldest. <laughs> Can we talk about Philip? I'd really like to, unless you... No. It's all right. Are you afraid right now? No. Yes. Have you read Anthony Adverse? No, but I hear it sold a million copies. Wonderful. I rent it from Walmarts. Philip, your first boyfriend? First serious. He's a fine man. Yes, he is. He interesting to be with? Interesting. Do you have things to talk about? Well, business mostly. I, I was head bookkeeper for Empire Steel in Long Island City years ago when we met, I mean. He didn't want you to work? No. I imagine you were a good businesswoman. Oh, I loved it. I've always enjoyed, you know, people depending on me. Yeah. Do I frighten you talking like this? A little. But I want you to. Why? I don't know. You make me feel hopeful. You mean of getting better? Of myself. Of getting... Getting what? Free. I want you to raise your knees. Come on. Bring them up. I can't. You can. I want you to send your thoughts into your hips. Tense your hips. Think of the bones in your hips. Come on now. The strongest muscles in your body are right there. You still have tremendous power there. Tense your hips. Now, you tense your thighs. Those are long, dense muscles with tremendous power. Now, just draw up your knees. Come on. Bring them up. Do it. Now keep it up. You concentrate. Raise them. Just do it for me. Arthur Miller, Broken Glass at the Booth Theater. I thank you for doing this. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you again. It's been a long time, and I thank you for taking an hour. Very much. Oh, good to be thank here. You. Arthur Miller. Thank you for joining us this evening. We look forward to seeing you next time. Until then.